My name is Kelly Cordes. I moved to Estes Park in about the year 2000. Moved into the Colorado Mountain School Guide Shack, a real bargain at 65 bucks a month. And uh, when we were politely asked to leave the shack, I moved across town into a little shack that we called the Chicken Coop for three years. Um, during that time, I was just focused completely on climbing and also trying to make my living as a writer which uh, so far has worked out. So I'm in a bigger shack now. It's still a shack and I climb as much as I can because it's the thing in life that makes me the happiest. We are interviewing Tom Hornbein at his house on November 16th, 2012. So what's your full name, Tom? My full name, Tom. Uh, Thomas Frederick Hornbein. I was born on November 6, 1930, which makes me a little, just a tad over 82 at this particular moment in time. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in St. Louis, in one of the suburbs of St. Louis, actually, uh, and uh, spent a lot of my life there uh, playing around climbing trees and had a couple of some very nice routes on our house, which had a steep slate roof, but I could go up to the top of it and sit on the eave up there and my mother couldn't find me and I'd stare out and look at the clouds and fantasize. Uh, and so I guess being off the ground was something that uh, got into my genes right from the very start, though it certainly didn't come from either of my parents. Uh, but for some reason that I never got around to asking them, they sent me to camp. Uh, Trails End Ranch, just down in Devil's Gulch Road, when I was 13. And after being terribly homesick for the first uh, year, uh, it, that was probably the biggest pivotal event in my life. It transformed my life when I discovered that mountains and cliffs had it all over uh, houses and trees. Uh, and everything else that's happened to me really has kind of followed. Uh, that passion for mountains and all they mean in so many different ways. Now, you ended up doing a profession that had, in a way, nothing to do with climbing, correct? Incorrect. <laughs> no, everything connects. Uh, I, I came, uh, well, let me just sort of continue that biographical journey a bit. Uh, I, uh, after being a camper for a while, and of course we were doing, we were climbing stuff down there in, in uh, out of Glenhaven and, and other places that we had no business being on back then with no ropes or nothing. Sometimes we had panniered ropes that we would take along and one of us would climb up and hold on to the end of it so the other uh, younger guys could hold on to it. <coughs> Uh, as they scrambled up, but uh, it was stuff that was made no sense uh, by any modern conceptions of of risk. Uh, we all survived it, fortunately, though that story hasn't always been that way. And then I became a counselor at that camp through my college years at Boulder, where I started out to become a geologist and got totally absorbed both from first in climbing and cutting labs uh, and in uh, the early onset of mountain rescue because Boulder was one of the two places where it really began and the other being in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. But I was one of the signers of the uh, Articles of Incorporation of Rocky Mountain Rescue back then. Uh, and uh, somewhere around the end of my third year, by virtue of getting involved with rescue and then taking and then teaching first aid, I thought, I don't really want to be a geologist. Uh, I'll apply to medical school. Uh, and I'll get to what may have been lurking in the background in a moment. But I applied to my hometown medical school, Washington University in St. Louis, and I didn't have any of the usual pre-med but they were willing to look at an oddball back then and, and 
figured that maybe with all of the rocks I'd had in my life, uh, I'd become a gallbladder surgeon or something like that. But uh, So I, I ended up in St. Louis for my medical school years, and during those summers, I uh, worked as a park naturalist here in Rocky, uh, and of course spent all of my spare time uh, climbing when my on my days off. So really, this valley was uh, the birthplace, uh, the training ground, and ultimately my spiritual home, which is sort of why I'm back here now. Uh, so that's a little bit of a nutshell. When I got into medical school, uh, I was starting out to be a surgeon. No, actually, my first thought was I wanted to be a GP in a place like Estes or Jackson. Uh, and this particular medical school is very research-oriented, and they don't even train primary care physicians, that is, uh, family physicians now. Uh, but So my next thought was, well, I'll go into surgery. Well, my professor of surgery uh, had had some exposure to anesthesia, and maybe he saw some non-talents in me that I didn't perceive in myself, but he, he said, well, I can train a monkey to do a hernia operation. Uh, why don't you think about anesthesia? And so I did, and I knew nothing about it, and during medical school I had no exposure to it whatsoever. But uh, it looked to me like uh, it might be a perfect way to combine my interest in taking care of patients with pursuing research. And my research interests were focusing around questions that had to do with how people respond when they go to altitude. Uh, and I figured, well, I, when I'm being a doc, I can focus all my attention here. When I'm doing my research, I can be 100% focused there. I, they don't have to compete with each other, and so this might be a, a good uh, kind of practice for my interest. And it turned out to be really perfect. I, uh, uh, after my research training, uh, well, after medical school, I uh, went out to Seattle and interned for a year and fell in love with the Northwest. Went back to St. Louis uh, for residency training in anesthesia and for two years of NIH supported uh, research training, uh, pursuing my physiological dreams or questions. And then got nailed by the Navy to pay off my obligations and a Barry, the Berry Plan, which was something that. Uh, male medical students back then got sucked into to defer uh, their uh, military obligation until they could serve it as a doc afterwards. So I ended up in San Diego uh, at the U.S. Naval Hospital as a uh, uh, faculty, young faculty. Uh, never did learn how to salute, or which I still don't know starboard from port, but uh, got involved in a little clinical research there. and. Then uh, the Everest expedition came along, which is another story for another day. Uh, and after Everest, I piled my family into our Volkswagen van and headed to Seattle, where I spent 43 years at the University of Washington as a uh, faculty in the departments of anesthesiology and physiology and biophysics, and eventually as chair of the department, and had just had a blast pursuing so many different things that uh, it's all been, uh, it's never been dull. So that's a little bit of a brief sketch, uh, uh, and we'll get back to what got me back here later, I guess. Yeah. yeah. When you were here first with your climbing, which I guess was at camp and also at the University of Colorado Boulder, do you remember your first technical roped climb and who it was with and which climb it was? I don't. Uh, I re I, what I do remember, but I can't say for sure that it was my first technical rope climb. I'm sure it wasn't actually, but when I started uh, in college, I can remember walking into the hiking club room at the student union building and there was this curly-headed, long, lanky lad sitting there uh, on the bench smoking a pipe underneath a big 
head of a wapiti, uh, a big elk up, hanging up above. And he looked up at me and he said something to the effect, do you want to go climbing? And he had been reading a trail and timberline guide to the Flatirons. So we had about, he had a maybe a 50 feet foot piece of of manila rope that he had gotten at the hardware store and we headed up to the third flat iron to something called 1911 Gully with this rope and the description of the route uh, from Trail and Timberline and then proceeded, one of us would climb up and then drop the rope down uh, for the other one to hold on to. That was my first uh, climbing mission. So I guess I'd not really uh, done roped climbing before then but it didn't take long for us to realize we needed to learn something and so we started reading mainly German literature and belaying the leader and things like that. <clears throat> and eventually, of course, I, we both ended up, Bill Braddock and I, and uh, teaching uh, for the phys ed department, a climbing course at CU. And, but that was probably two or three years later into, a, into the scheme of things. But in the beginning, it was all trial and error. It was all manila ropes, nylon was soon to come, but hadn't quite gotten onto the scene then. Uh, the pitons that we owned were mainly ones that we uh, could go down to Colorado Springs and extract from the trees and things where the Army had put them in. Uh, so we had piles of pitons from these outings collecting uh, soft iron pitons. And then Halyabar was our main source of supply for imported carabiners and all that sort of stuff. And then you started putting those to use in the park and at Lumpy Ridge. You've pioneered in the 50s and 60s numerous routes in the area. Do any of your first ascents in this area particularly stand out? Uh, well, there's not all that many when you get right down to it, but I mean, we were just young kids going out on adventures and wandering around uh, looking for things that looked interesting. And part of the scene, of course, played out uh, down in Boulder on the flat irons and the maiden and the matron. And uh, there were some routes down there, uh, probably the most notable of them, I guess, historically at least, being the Northwest Passage on the uh, northwest side of the third flat iron. Uh, up here, we, we would come up here during uh, breaks between quarters. I think it was quarters and not, I don't know whether it's quarters or semesters, but during those breaks we'd just uh, come up and play. So there were a lot of winter ascents of Long's Peak or maybe a lot of winter attempts at a sense of Long's Peak and occasional summer days up there in the middle of January. But uh, we and my first time on skis was skiing up to Timberline and which was fine with army surplus skis and mohair skins. The ride down was something else again. I took out a bit of the uh, vegetation of Rocky Mountain National Park uh, and it took out a little bit of the orientation of my nose. Uh, but uh, that's sort of how we began to get a taste of winter mountaineering. and. Sometimes when the weather was awful up on the peak, we'd uh, climb around on the things here in the valley. Uh, I can remember a couple of those in particular during these breaks. One was walking into town because from we would actually we would camp out or stay out. Uh, Julie Mor Julia Morrissey would let us hang out at what was then the Hughes Kirkwood Inn, which is now Rocky Ridge Music School. So we put our our sleeping bags down on the floor there. And then in the daytime, I remember one day Bob Riley and I were going to uh, just go into town. And so we thought we'd hitch a ride and we walked and we walked and walked and no cars came by. Uh, and eventually we got under Prospect Mountain and we looked up at those little pinnacles that are called the, now the thumb and the thimble. The lower one of the two back then was known as Tom's Thumb because we went up there and started, I started leading up uh, the, I guess it would be the east side of it, what's now a 5-7 pitch. And I got up to where I didn't think I wanted to go higher, 
hung until my hands gave out and I said, Bob, I'm coming down and I opened my hands and down I came. And uh, then we walked into town and went to Doc Malls. Uh, he put three pieces of tape around my three broken ribs, charged six dollars, which seemed out of sight. And uh, then the rest of that spring break, why uh, my buddies kept me laughing because it, it, it took, gave them great pleasure to watch me gripping my side in pain and laughter all at the same time. Uh, my first story, I don't know whether there was any other routes on Lumpy Ridge when we climbed uh, what's now known as the Central Chimney on the Twin Owls. But it was one of those things where, you know, it was, we didn't have anything to do and we looked up and we saw it and we walked over and, and it was an interesting climb, especially the second of the two pitches which I got to lead, which was a uh, totally unprotected, at least back then before cams, uh, f kind of flaring chimney. I suspect you've been up it and know what I'm talking about. Actually, I've avoided it because it looks <laughs> wide and scary, but it, it does have a reputation. And I was going to ask, how, what did you use to protect the wide climbs? I mean, that we're talking the 1950s. There weren't wide camelots and big bros. Well, life was simple back then. Uh, there were pitons. And when you could put them into a crack, and sometimes you had to be very innovative. If the crack was too big, even for angles, you'd you'd stack pitons. I mean, there are things that if you fell off on them, uh, th they wouldn't be there, of course, but uh, it always gave you a little sense of security uh, to move. So that was the main thing. Uh, probably the most, the one climb that I ever did that after having, well, I really lived with it for several years before succeeding in climbing it, was the chasm view crack. I guess it's called Hornbine's crack. And uh, the, uh, the last 60 feet of that is a little more than vertical. And I would guess with jamming techniques, which were not part of our repertoire now, you might be able to do it with a bit more security, but uh, basically it was a lieback. And once you took off, uh, that was it. And so you had 60 feet uh, uh, and until you finally got that, thank God, hold up there, and your heart could slow down a little bit. Uh, and, uh, but I remember thinking that we could go up there and put in some big wooden two by four wedges and pound them in, <clears throat> not too bright, uh, pick the cheapest wood we could buy, which was, of course, ponderosa pine. And when you pounded it in, it sort of turned into sawdust. Uh, so that, but anyway, I, I think I made three attempts on the thing. One was a rainy day when uh, Bob Frosten, who was then the Long Speak Ranger, happened to be coming by up above and dropped a rope so we could get out. Uh, another time, we were just at the base of the final pitch. I think that was with Dex Brinker. Uh, and somebody was coming off of Broadway onto Mills Lamb Slide and slipped and fell and went, it was a pretty spectacular fall and we thought there was gonna be a body at the bottom of it. But it kind of took the starch out of my sails for leading at that time. And the third time, uh, we just, it just, we just cruised it. Uh, I mean, you just had, you, there, you couldn't be fiddling around anymore. You just had to get going and do it. But once done, it was, uh, I knew I, it was something I would never want to lead again. And I haven't. Uh, there's a few things I've gone back to nostalgically in these latter years, uh, and that's been fun. But uh, the two things that I've just touched on, both the, the Hornbine Crack and, and the Central Chimney, uh, so far at least I haven't had a great urge to return to. And the, uh, the Hornbine Crack, as it's known. I believe that was 1953, so the, the diamond hadn't even been climbed yet. Do you remember looking over at that thing and thinking, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that one of these days, or, in, or were there your thoughts different? Well, let's see, it couldn't, I don't think it would have been 53. Is that what the guidebook says? But, yeah, but Because I don't think I wrong. was on the scene any, well, no, I was, I'm sorry, it could, it could be, well be right. Uh, at 51, I guess I should mention Zumi's thumb too. Yeah, that was uh, next. <laughs> because in a way, uh, 
that, in a way, that's one of my most precious climbs, not because of the thumb per se, but because of Zumi. And uh, I didn't meet, this is getting ahead of the story, but I didn't meet Zumi until the 90s, but he became a very dear friend. And we'll come to that, at, I hope, in due course. Uh, but uh, we did go up and climb Zumi's, uh, Dex Brinker and Harry Waldrop and I, we wrapped off uh, into the notch and it it was another, a little bit more of the same. It wasn't e easily protectable and the techniques that we, the crux pitch, have you climbed it? Uh, the crux pitch, which is rated 5.9 now with climbing shoes, uh, was not with the stuff we had on our feet. I don't think I could, could have climbed it even then uh, f free. But what I was able to do on, on this last little final bit, uh, it's not to the, quite to the top, but the last little bit is just a scramble, is bring Harry Waldrop up uh, with Dex Brinker down below belaying. And Harry stood on a little ledge about that big. And I stood, I proceeded to climb up Harry, first knees, and then a shoulder, and then a head, and then a hand, and then just put my heart in my mouth and, and uh, over the top uh, of that little last bit I went and that was it. And so we all tucked ourselves together up on the tiny top of this thing, feeling very pleased with ourselves. Uh, even Dex, who had been at a party the night before and was a little hungover most of the day, it did get his attention. So it was a, it was a wonderful uh, climb and it was even more wonderful uh, as it came back into my life uh, years later. We, as we just picking up where we left off, how it came back with Zumi. Well, after uh, my summers during medical school were all spent as a park naturalist and also sort of the uh, park authority on rescue uh, as a consequence of RMR days. And uh, the uh, uh, and I can remember going up to the Tetons once and meeting Dick Emerson, who was one of our Westridge uh, team on Everest, who was the climbing ranger there and exchanging ideas and stuff. Uh, but I, RMR, uh, I got it was just starting up. I didn't start it. A guy named Gordon Snow really was sort of, and a a. a, a engineering professor whose name I think, I may get it wrong, but I think it was Hildebrand or something, were the ones that really conceived the idea. And, uh, but I can remember being right in on the beginning of it with them and a bunch of these ex-veterans uh, from the Second World War and 10th Mountain Troops, people like Wes Horner and Tom Taylor. I can remember at one of the meetings we were discussing building snow shelters, igloos, and. Taylor comes out with the expression or describing how you construct an, or circumcise an igloo. And of course that brought down the house. He didn't realize what he had said. Uh, the, uh, uh, there was something else I was going to say about our RMR. Oh, uh, we, we, the thing that, the way we learn how to, you know, the fun is, you know, getting, lowering people off of cliffs and stuff like that. And this was an undeveloped uh, activity in, back then in this country. But a guy named Wassel Mariner, a German, had written a book, which we couldn't read, but we could look at the pictures. Uh, and so from Haliabar, uh, we managed to get this book and we began to play with uh, learning how to lower a Stokes litter. So we went up, uh, our first real serious litter lower was up on the face of the third flat iron. And a bunch of us went up there and we tucked uh, uh, somebody into the litter and we had it all rigged off of these bolts that uh, were, they'd been up, put up there long before us. And we're lowering it down. And it all went just perfectly, except when we got down, the sheriff was waiting for us at the bottom. Uh, actually back down at Bluebell Shelter, not at the bottom of the, third, the first third flat iron, uh, and concerned about what was going on up there because some woman had been looking out 
her window and saw the activity up there and called the sheriff's office. So we had an agreement after that that when we were going to be doing our, our play up there that we would let them know ahead of time. Uh, the other event that RMR got involved in in 49 uh, well, I should say I and a few of my RMR buddies, but we, uh, Dale Johnson and a young friend of his, they had just started school, and they thought it would be really neat to have a big C painted on the third flat iron. So they went up there and they did it. Well, some of my 10th Mountain buddies greeted, had got wind of this because one of my other climbing buddies, Dick Sherman, happened to be up there soloing. Uh, <laughs> in the moonlight up the third and came across them and came down and told well, these, other, these tough guys what was going on. So they met Dale and his friend as they came down and tied him to a tree up by Bluebell. They eventually got law uh, loose, but part of their, what the judge assigned them as a task was to remove the sea. But then uh, I think his name was Robert Stearns, the president of, of CU at the time, as they were starting to go about doing this, was beginning to think maybe about the liability of that and decided maybe that wasn't a good idea. So RMR kind of inhabited or inherited the opportunity to remove that sea. So we spent hours, that we had a whole stash of, of uh, paint remover and five gallon jerry cans and ropes and scrub brushes and God knows what. And we spent hours up there dorking around, playing, trying to get the sea off. And of course, the sea, the paint did come off, but under the paint was this very pink outline of a sea from all the other stuff that was, had been coating the rock left and right. To, uh, so it was visible for a long time and to come after that and maybe had been, had been refurbished a few times over the course of years. But those, those were not exactly life-saving rescue experiences. And in fact, during those years, beginning years, there weren't many of those. Uh, nothing terribly notable to talk about. But anyway, coming back to uh, the evolution, I graduated from medical school in 1955, and this life of play came to a close. I had to get serious about life. So in 56, uh, I had to intern after my graduation. And so I, the 55 was my last year here uh, for a long time. I came back in 1973 with Kathy, my wife, now wife briefly, and two of my kids had been in camp and took Bob and daughter Lynn up Alexander's chimney on the east face. And that, and I, that's when I first met Steve Comito, who had a, his shop out at, at the crossroads at uh, Beaver Point. And, it was a very brief visit, but I, that was, so between 1955 and 1973, I had no contact with the park. And then again after that, once I went to Seattle and between work and the North Cascades and the mountains there, I didn't come back here and again for almost another two decades. In 1990, uh, the phone rang at our home uh, uh, in Bellevue, Washington, and it was a guy named Jim Detterline uh, calling me and saying he was putting together a historical symposium. And the story behind why this was happening was that that year, three guys had walked into the ranger station up at Long's Peak Trailhead, uh, three old guys, and they were just sort of reminiscing about things. And he just listened to them and, and overheard them. And the three guys were Clarence Zumwalt, Hull Cook, and Ev Long, who in their teenage years had been guides up at the Boulder Field on Logs. This would be around the early 1930s, when about the time I was being born. And uh, they would hang out at the Boulder Field Hotel, as it was called, and take uh, people who might come up and ride their horses up to the boulder field and stay overnight. And they would take it one, sometimes even two groups of people up the cable route on longs. Uh, and just, and otherwise they would just played and had a ball. And so Jim saw these three who were all about 80 at the time and thought, you know, there's a bit of history there. 
And this is where the idea of having this event the following year at the Y came about. So he got the three of them to come and he got Paul Stettner to come. Uh, and then I was sort of the next generation down. He invited me and the, uh, and then it dribbled down from there through Leighton Cord uh, was there and I don't remember, but uh, through the generations of probably the 60s, which was after I had left the scene and, and numbers of people talking about climbing on longs. And this is where I met Zumi. And it seemed appropriate for my talk, since I had a good collection of pictures to go with it, to talk about the first ascent of Zumi's thumb with, those, with him in the audience. And the way the thumb had been named is that Evlong's brother uh, had just pinned Zumi's name onto this spike. And Zumi always thought he would love to climb it, but the, the technology you know, just wasn't quite there back in those days, and it was really 20 years later that we made the first ascent. Uh, but Zumi came into my life, and here was this bubbly, effervescent, wonderful person, and we became fast friends, he and Jim and I. Uh, and Zumi would come out every summer from Marin County uh, and spend a few weeks, and each summer he'd be a little slower, but he'd walk up to the base. Jim and I would go up and climb things on Lumpy Ridge and Zumi would walk up to the base and just hang out. And each year it got a little more uh, tentative. And then in 1995 he'd had some surgery uh, and following that he, he went into renal shutdown and when he uh, finally kind of woke up from uh, the sedation, he said, uh, no more. And uh, his wife had died about nine years earlier. And I flew down from Seattle and with some of his friends there at the Audubon Canyon Ranch, uh, which is sort of a, uh, a, a bit of wild preserve down on the Bolinas coast. Uh, we came down and we took Zumi home from the hospital and tucked him in the bed. Uh, where he could look out at Mount Tamil Pius. And uh, the first thing he wanted was uh, to listen to some music. Uh, I think it was La Traviata that I put onto his player. Uh, but basically he went home to die, and which he did in style over the next couple of days. And all his friends came in. Ev Long and Hull Cook called up. Hull talked to him. Ev didn't want to talk to him. But uh, Ev, who had been having lung trouble and using oxygen down in Boulder, at his iris farm place, uh, passed the word through me, and then when we hung up, Zumi looks up at me and he said, "Well, now you know there Ev, he's sicker than I am," and uh, but it was kind of a party for those parting days, and just typical of Zumi. I mean, just what a guy. <laughs> uh, before that, I remember after we got to know each other, he wanted me to sign a copy of my book, Everest the West Ridge, the Big Sierra Club version for him. And what I inscribed in that, which he cherished, and I too, uh, was to Zumi, whose thumb I knew long before the rest of him. So that was Zumi, <laughs> wonderful human being. What was Zumi's last name? Claren Zumwalt. Oh, Claren And I Zumwalt. don't know, I, Jim will know, he may have some distant relation to the Admiral, but I'm not sure. So anyway, let's see, where were they? So 91 was what brought me back to Estes Park. And after that, uh, I or we started coming back for a little while every summer. And I was also getting, uh, well, somewhere during the course of that, I was getting near the end of, uh, it was time to retire from my professional career. And so we began to think a little bit about where, what leaving Seattle, even though I did, I don't think Kathy did. Uh, even though it was a wonderful place to get, live and with the best mountains I've ever been in up in the North Cascades, uh, it was getting crowded and the traffic was, I, it was time to just stir things up for another one more time. And, and 
So he started talking with Harry Kent and, and he suggested he might have a piece of land he could sell us up on where he, he lives. And, but building a house really at our stage in life, and it's a steep road and old people driving uh, up there in snow, it just didn't, and then all the permitting, it got to be too complicated. So on impulse we started looking around in 2003 and, uh, and this just connected to this place that we're in right now. And uh, uh, purchased this place and then finally moved here in, t in uh, the winter of 2006. Uh, part of my reason for lingering in Seattle is one of my wonderful climbing buddies, uh, Pete Schoening, uh, who was the ice axe savior, Pete's uh, most infamous moment, uh, which is immortalized by the ice axe down at the museum in Golden, was saving the fall of his five buddies on K2 in 1953. And Pete had uh, ended up with uh, diagnosed with multiple myeloma, and it, we would go out and hike every week, and as long as Pete was alive, I, I wasn't leaving Seattle, but and he died in 2004. And uh, then we uh, finally got it together and got and moved here in 2006. You're back here in Estes. It brings it a little bit full circle. The, and you've spent a lot of time up around the Longs Peak area. When was the first time you climbed the diamond? Do you remember that experience? Uh, vividly. I only climbed it once. Uh, I was just about 65. Would have been 1995. It was the year that the mountain never opened. It was all iced up, so it gets to be a story too, of course. Uh, I over the <clears throat> well. Let me go back to 1991. After the uh, this big of a historical event, uh, Jim Detterline and my colleague Brownie Shaney, who had been my protege, he was an internist, pulmonary medicine doc, uh, who was on a research sabbatic year at something Charlie Houston had started in uh, Keystone called the Colorado Altitude Research Institute. And Brownie had a girlfriend named Carmel, and they'd been living up in Montezuma. And anyway, the four of us went up to climb Stetner's Ledges, which I hadn't been back to since the 50s. Uh, and we did. Uh, it, it was the more notable parts of that were just getting to the base of it because the glacier was very icy and we didn't have anything but to scratch our feet into it with. The, uh, but we, we uh, got up it. But at, at this point, Brownie got and Carmel got all excited about the diamond. Uh, I hadn't had any great interest in it. Uh, back in my day, it was uh, kind of a peripheral in interest. And when you had asked about, did I think about climbing it? Well, there was a time, and I guess it was in 55, where uh, three of us, Phil Ritterbush, and I'm going to have a senior moment on uh, the, the guy who was the head of the Blister Rust crew, but he lives in this area. Do you happen to know who I'm thinking of? Anyway, we went up. Uh, we're doing something up there, but on the way, somehow into the day, got the idea of going out on the diamond. So we, we walked out table ledge, and then Phil climbed out about a rope length, to probably about where you would top off now from the top of the casual route. Uh, and I've got a spectacular photograph of him that uh, is out in the domain somewhere at this point. But that was the closest we came to. And then when we got down, uh, the Park Service had put out this sign that the diamond is closed to climbing. And that would have been, I'm guessing, 55. And then, of course, the pressure mounted. And eventually, much to Dale Johnson's dismay, uh, the uh, permission was granted to uh, a couple of Californians, Rierks and Camps, and they made the first ascent of the diamond, what, in 60 or 61? somewhere around then. And then, of course, it's turned into a vertical playground. Anyway, uh, on the, after the Stettner's climb, the idea was we, we could climb the diamond, and I could climb it too, even though I wasn't young anymore. 
And so we made a numbers of attempts over the years. We actually, uh, on one of them, Jim and Brownie and I, and I don't know. Who, anyway, we got caught in the queue on the casual route and, and just decided it was we weren't going to get up there that day, so we bailed. Another time we went up, it was Jim and Brownie and Krakauer and I, and we were going to be the first in the queue. So uh, we bivvied and, uh, down around Chasm Lake, got up on a totally malicious day, fog you couldn't see this far, and went up North Chimney in the dark. Uh, we were first in the queue. There was no queue. And what's more, you couldn't, we couldn't even see the wall. So uh, we got back down by about 9 a.m. and uh, had a leisurely day. Anyway, it's not long after Brownie uh, came out for one of his four-day attempts, uh, which would be flying out one day, going up to Bivy the next day, attempting the next day, and flying home the next day. And Brownie has yet to climb the diamond. But uh, a few, not long after that, just a few days, uh, Jim and George Piva, another one of the Long Speak Rangers, and I went up there and climbed the casual route. Uh, and it was a, a love. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, you've been uh, Kelly on big walls, and you know what they're like. But this was, in a way, the first time I've been really on a big, high mountain bit of verticality. And after a while, it just seemed like that vertical dimension was the way the world was meant to be. It was so exhilarating to just be up there. And the climbing, of course, is it's attention getting. It wasn't all that difficult, uh, even at that stage in my life. But it was a good workout. Uh, there was a, a couple of uh, guys in their 40s from back in the Northeast who were ahead of us. And we managed to stay fairly evenly paced. Actually, were they ahead? No, they were behind us. And. When we got up to where you traverse off to Table Ledge, they were, uh, it was getting pretty late in the day. And so we dropped a rope to their leader for that, the crux pitch on the thing. And so then now there were five of us as we scampered on up to the top. And we got to the top, this is summer, but it, so it wasn't dark, but it was about eight o'clock in the evening. And the mountain, uh, the keyhole route was still iced up. Uh, it w had been a sp spectacular, heavy season, and Jim and I, and actually we went up earlier in the season and climbed the North Face on snow all the way and watched a couple of snowboarders coming down. It was pretty impressive. Uh, so the uh, and we didn't have any, we didn't have an axes or crampons or that stuff, and I thought, well, we could biffy up here on top, and Jim thought, no, we can get down okay. So we headed down the keyhole, and it got dark, and we decided that, and it was pretty icy. So if you can imagine trying to rappel down the trough, I'm not sure, this may have been the, the first rappel descent of the trough. I don't know, but it, it, all in the dark, and running water, and snow, and ice, and rubble, uh, and we managed to devote many hours, and we finally got down to where you start the traverse, and got a little ways, and then there was a snow field, and we couldn't see what was next. So we decided we'd just have to bivy, which we did, all five of us, and, and uh, I kept waking people up so they wouldn't freeze to death that it wasn't that cold. You could see the lights of the cars over on Trail Ridge. It was a wonderful bivouac, and we can talk more about bivouacs in a bit, but uh, it was just one in my litany of unplanned moments. But utterly gorgeous. And Jim had called down on his radio for a sort of a rescue. And then when the sun came up, we could see that with one more rappel diagonally down across this snowfield, we were home free. So we met our rescue party, uh, thank God for them, uh, as we were just leaving the boulder field. Uh, and they were burdened with Oreos. So we sat there and feasted on Oreos for a while before we headed on down. So that was my one climb of the diamond, and it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. Outstanding. And um, 
you've spent a lot of time in the park over the years, back in the 50s and 60s and then more recently. During that gap, for those who don't know, you started doing a lot of big trips, Pakistan, Nepal, the Karakoram, the Himalaya, and you made what's rightly considered one of the greatest ascents in mountaineering history. In 1963, you and Willie Unsold did the first ascent of the West Ridge on Mount Everest. How did your experiences in the park back then help to build up to climbing in the greater ranges? How did they... Yeah, did, did they help prepare you? Was it well, abs I mean, it was my, I mean, everything that I, that we self-taught ourselves here was really the preparation for, I guess you say, the big mountains. Uh, I didn't have dreams or ever have an, even an expectation I would ever be doing anything like that. But all the rock climbing and fiddling around, making our own mistakes and somehow surviving them, the winter camping, the winter climbs on longs, uh, they, were, uh, they were really the underpinnings of everything that followed. I can remember once going up in the winter with Dick Sherman, uh, and I had on a pair of, uh, I think, bend iron crampons with uh, no front points, uh, we didn't have, we, we had pitons, and we went up to climb Alexander's Chimney, which was a runnel of ice. So I was pounding angles down into the ice, and of course they were fine if you were below them, but they, were, they came right out the minute you had a slight upward pull. And here we were in the middle of the night, you could look down at all the lights of the towns on, in Denver and everything down below. It was kind of an eerie, but beautiful. And, thing and we didn't know what we were doing and fortunately uh, <clears throat> we managed to not to fall off and uh, climbed it but it was that's I mean those were the learning experiences and then when I interned in Seattle I met uh, Mount Rainier and uh, with its glaciers and my first real climb of uh, ice there was on Mount Adams on the glacier on the north side, Adams Glacier, I guess. And all I could apply to it was my old rock climbing techniques. I <clears throat> went with some guy that Pete Schoening had connected me with. I don't remember his name. And, and uh, we climbed up it. And uh, you know, rock climbing techniques worked just fine with crampons on your feet and an ax. But this was in the days before, I mean, ice climbing is a total di different ball game now. But that was all uh, the prepar preparatory stuff. After my internship, I had my first mini expedition, which was to Mount Huntington in Alaska with uh, five of us, Fred Becky, John Rupley, Herb Staley, and Wes Grandy and I. And we made an attempt on Huntington uh, uh, and had the smarts to bail when, when we were sort of shoveling our way through corn snow, vertical corn snow. But uh, it was, that was my first taste of a little expedition, uh, flown in by Don Sheldon to the Ruth, uh, to up the Ruth Glacier and, and put down just under Huntington. And then in 1960, uh, my old Chile buddy, Nick Clinch had been, who's three days younger than I am, had been a camper at, at main camp. And I ended up over there one year as a junior counselor and we met and Nick, became really the major force in organizing expeditions out of this country, including Hidden Peak in 1958, where Pete uh, Schoening and Andy Kaufman made the only uh, first American ascent of an 8,000 meter peak. And then in 1960, he put a, a, together an expedition to Masherbroom. And I was invited to go along, partly as the doc, partly as a climber. Uh, No. Oh, okay. After four rings, it'll shut up. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Are we? And this is where I met. Uh, it was a very small, wonderful party. Uh, but this is where I first met. Well, I didn't know. It's not where I first met Willie, actually. 
uh, I first met him on that soiree to the Tetons to talk to Dick Emerson about rescue techniques. So I measured him, uh, Willie and George Bell, who had been on the 53K2 expedition, made, got to the top, made the first ascent uh, in the clinch and uh, one of our Pakistanis a couple of days later while my dock roll prevented me from going to the top, though it, came, it was close. Uh, but I remember going to Mashabram really anxious about how I would do it at really high altitude and discovered that uh, it was fine. I really, it was no big deal. I, you go slow, you puff a lot, but, uh, and so when I was asked, invited to go to Everest, I knew that if I didn't get sick, that physically I was going to be okay. And that was probably, having that past experience probably was a real uh, virtue uh, in regard to that. So, Everest was my second big expedition, and then, as you commented, with Nick primarily, there were a variety, a number of little offbeat events that came after that. In 1974, we went back to the Karakoram uh, to try to climb a beautiful peak called Paiju, and uh, had a death of one of our Pakistanis on that. Made the first crossing out of the Baltoro to the south around Masherbrum, over what we call the Masherbrum La. And then in 85, we went on a very exotic, uh, politically fraught expedition to a peak called Ulug Mustag in the vast wasteland of Central Asia with first American joint Chinese expedition with, again, which Nick and Bob Bates, uh, they're the two that had put that, put that together. And then, uh, back to China again in 88 and 89 to climb a peak uh, between the Mekong and Salween rivers that has not yet, as far as I know, been climbed, but it's taken the lives of quite a, well, there was one big disaster of a Chinese, joint Chinese-Japanese expedition with 13 climbers buried, I think, in an avalanche. And I kind of lost interest in that. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of my exotic climbing history in, uh, in Central Asia, uh, in a nutshell. Well, you've spent a lot of nights in the mountains uh, throughout your life, but um, one night in particular has become known around the climbing world, and it was after you and Willie did the first ascent of the West Ridge of Everest in 63, and when you guys descended the other side of the mountain, and, and nobody had ever traversed the peak like that before, uh, darkness fell on you guys, and you guys endured a forced bivouac. Uh, it sounded like a brutal night at 28,000 feet. But in your, in your incredible book, Everest, the West Ridge, you also describe the beauty of that night. And it's something that it seems that uh, you've appreciated in the mountains all these years. Would you mind reading that passage for us? No, I'd be honored to do that, Kelly, <laughs> because... You know, with this 50th anniversary coming up, there's a lot of reminiscence going on, but uh, part of what I wrote about that night that we all finally decided we couldn't see where we were going and we had to just uh, settle out uh, and hope that uh, we'd still be there in the morning. But it was, uh, you know, we each kind of huddled up on our own pack, board, pack frames. Our, Willie and I had Kelties and shivered the night away. Uh, but it was a, it was a magical night in some ways, and what I wrote about it uh, was the night was overpoweringly empty. Stars shed cold, unshimmering light. The heat lightning dancing along the plain spoke of a world of warmth and flatness. The black silhouette of Lhotse lurked half-sensed, half-seen, still below. Only the ridge we were on rose higher disappearing into the night, a last lonely outpost of the world. And I hear that sometimes these days, even still, you take a sleeping bag up to a little rock outcrop here behind your house at Lumpy Ridge and spend the night out under the stars. You know, you're 82 years old and I presume you have a comfortable bed. Um, it, does that still bring you back to those 
memories in any way? Oh, it, it, not so much, I have to say. I, when, when we're out under the stars, uh, it's like you're in that world. And it's not a, it really is, in some ways, an identical world. The stars may shimmer here a bit, uh, and maybe we're too high in the atmosphere for that to be happening up on Everest. But uh, and back in, in all those years, up to and through Everest at least, my, uh, my affair with bivouacs was not a planned one. It was, uh, they, they just happened and uh, alas, one didn't really, I mean the idea of bivouacking on Everest was not part of our thinking. And so thinking, I mean, bivy sacks didn't, weren't part of the scheme of things. So you just uh, did what you had to do. But that was the way most of my life had, uh, in the mountains had been when uh, you didn't often get benighted, but sometimes you did. And the bivouac uh, coming down after the casual route in 1995 was a perfect example. Uh, and there's, throughout my life, there's been a series of those special unplanned moments which are utterly unforgettable moments in their beauty and their aloneness and a certain amount of discomfort. Our bivy on Everest was, uh, it, w it might have been a different story if the wind hadn't died down. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, there might not have been, I wouldn't, might not have been here telling the story at all, but we were really lucky. And the wind did die down, it was probably 17 below, but we were, Pretty well dressed, uh, but clearly Willie and and Barry Bishop lost uh, most of their toes and Barry a few fingertips. So uh, it was a night for which we paid a price. But uh, you know, I guess you can look at it in retrospect and say, was it worth it? And you might as well answer yes because <laughs> that's the way it is. But uh, and it was. But you get on with life and and do what you can afterwards, and that's the way the whole rest of the story flows. <laughs>